At first glance, these two airflow patterns look like they're telling opposite stories, but they're actually solving different problems. One is calm and contained, the other is open, energetic, and constantly moving. It would be easy to say one of these is better, but here, that would be missing the point. This is a closed roof grand tour designed to keep air out of the cabin and make airflow as predictable as possible. And this is a purpose built speedster designed from the ground up to operate without a roof, not by eliminating turbulence, but by controlling it. Today, we're looking at how two very different design philosophies manage airflow at real world driving speeds and why both approaches make sense for each car's design intent. If you're interested in how aerodynamic design actually works beyond marketing claims, this channel breaks it down using CFD one design problem at a time. We're evaluating each car against its own goals, not against each other. Knowing that, what is a successful design for each car? For the M6, that means comfort, noise control, performance, and good looks as a luxury car. For the Minstrel, that means performance and hypercar looks. So the problem it faces is very different to the M6 F06, one being controlling the wake from the open roof. Both cars are simulated at 72 km per hour, a speed where aerodynamic drag begins to dominate over rolling resistance. This makes it a useful regime for studying baseline airflow before higher speed effects become significant. Starting with a BMW, the most striking feature is just how stable and predictable the flow is. This is a very robust aerodynamic setup. If we look at the center plane, the way the hood and windshield are blended together is particularly effective. The windshield slopes downwards while the hood rises gently, reducing the angle the airflow has to turn around as it moves up the vehicle. Because of that, the flow doesn't decelerate very much in this region. The streamlines remain relatively straight and the kinetic energy of the free stream is largely preserved. That shows up clearly in the dynamic pressure plot. The free stream dynamic pressure is around 240 pascals and even at the hood windshield junction, much of the flow remains well above 100 pascals. Only very close to the surface do we see substantial energy losses. The simulations you're seeing here were run using open foam. If you want to learn open foam, I have a full open foam course linked on my website. Moving laterally away from the center line, the behavior actually improves further. Here the dynamic pressure rises closer to 150 pascals, meaning even less kinetic energy has been lost. This tells us the geometry is working consistently across the width of the car, not just at a single slice. That same design philosophy continues towards the rear. In the center plane, it's difficult to clearly identify where the rear window ends and the trunk begins. This smooth transition limits how abruptly the flow decelerates as it reaches the back of the car, which is beneficial for drag control. There is some deceleration here. The flow speed drops roughly from 20 meters per second to around 14, but this leads to two useful outcomes. First, it creates a region of relatively high pressure on the trunk surface. That pressure contributes to a modest amount of downforce, helping push the car into the road. BMW could have chosen to further streamline this region to reduce the drag even more, but that would have reduced this high pressure. Instead, they opted for a balanced approach. Notably, there's no traditional rear spoiler. Small spoilers are very effective at generating downforce, but they also tend to increase wake size by deflecting the flow upwards and increasing drag. Rather than accepting that trade-off, BMW gave this trunk a slight upwards angle. In effect, it behaves like a large gentle spoiler instead of a sharp one. That preserves some downforce while keeping the wake relatively compact. Underneath the front of the car, the priorities shift. The sharp front edge leads to some flow separation underneath, which adds drag. This appears to be a deliberate compromise in favor of styling and visual aggression, rather than pure aerodynamic efficiency. The wheels follow a similar pattern. The open rim design looks performance oriented, but it generates large wheel wakes. 
and that contributes noticeably to the overall drag. One particularly well executed area is just behind the rear wheels. Although the side panels taper inwards, the rear wheel arches themselves remain smooth rather than flared. This allows the flow coming off the rear wheels to stay attached and travel downstream cleanly. That reduces the wake size and rear pressure drag. Taken as a whole, the BMW has a drag coefficient of 0.35. This BMW simulation was actually commissioned by one of your amigos, Patrick. If you're interested in having your own car simulated, you can commission it through my website. The BMW also produces 16.7 kilos of lift. Let's look at a car solving a completely different aerodynamic problem. The Bugatti Minstrel shows a very different flow structure in the center plane, and that difference is intentional. Unlike the BMW, this car has to satisfy several competing requirements at once. It needs to move a very large amount of air for cooling and engine operation, it operates with an open roof, and it still has to maintain aerodynamic stability and reasonable drag. The front of the car reflects that priority immediately. The large open intake geometry is designed to supply the engine and radiators with the airflow they need. The trade-off is a deliberate separation region as the flow moves around the front edge. Rather than trying to eliminate the separation, Bugatti actually uses it strategically. By allowing the flow over the upper surface to be lower energy, the kinetic energy impact in the open cabin and the rear deck is reduced. That shows up clearly in the dynamic pressure plot, where values over the upper surface sit closer to 100 to 150 pascals. Lower energy flow in this region reduces sensitivity and makes the open top configuration more manageable. This approach becomes especially important once you consider the open roof. With an exposed cabin, controlling where turbulence forms is far more important than simply trying to remove it. At the rear of the windshield, the geometry is tuned so that the flow detaches at a very specific height. This allows a shear layer to pass cleanly over the open cabin and reconnect downstream rather than breaking down unpredictably. As a result, the wake behind the cabin is reduced and better defined. One of the most interesting features is the wing placed just behind the cabin. Bugatti used it productively. The wing adds downforce and helps reorganize the wake, taking advantage of a region that would otherwise contribute primarily to drag. This becomes clear when we look at the two sets of streamlines here. The color streamlines originate upstream of the car, while the white streamlines originate inside the cabin. Notice how the two flow paths remain largely separate. External airflow passes over the wing, while the cabin air exits underneath it. This region reduces buffeting and improves occupant comfort. A critical consideration for an open top speedster. Underneath the car, the aerodynamic philosophy shifts again. The front lip is gently curved upwards, allowing the flow to remain attached underneath the nose. This produces a stable low pressure region and more consistent downforce. At the rear, the diffuser uses large guide vanes to isolate the wakes generated by the wide rear tires. These streaks reduce how much low energy flow reaches the diffuser, preserving some higher energy flow there. This is particularly important given the tire's width required to transmit the minstrel's power, which inevitably increases the wheel wake size. In this everyday driving configuration, not the maximum performance mode, the resulting drag coefficient is 0.37, while it produces 6.9 kilos of lift values that reflect the car's priorities. The design focus on controllability, cooling capacity, and stability in an open cabin layout, rather than minimizing drag and isolation. This is where the differences become clearest. Not in which car is better, but in how each one chooses to solve the different aerodynamic problems it has. Both cars are shown at the same speed, using the same visualizations and the same reference planes. The BMW's approach is preventative. Its geometry works to keep the flow attached and energetic, minimizing the conditions that lead to turbulence in the first place. The Minstrel takes the opposite approach, simply because it has different needs. 
it allows separation to form and then deliberately guides it and controls it through carefully shaped surfaces and flow paths. Where the BMW smooths transitions to reduce wake formation, the Minstrel organizes its wake to keep it stable and predictable. One is designed for comfort and stability at speed. The other is designed to manage an open top, high powered environment. If you want a deeper, structured explanation of these concepts like separation control, wake management and design trade-offs, I also have a full course on automotive aerodynamics linked on my site. These differences can be seen, for example, at the front where BMW doesn't produce nearly as great a wake, or in the diffuser where the Minstrel incorporates very large drakes to control the wheel wakes, or in the BMW's effective blending of the roof into the trunk, or the Minstrel needs an open rear section. The more complex flow of the Minstrel doesn't inherently mean it has worse aerodynamics. In this case, it is just built for something different. So what do we actually take away from this? The biggest lesson is that aerodynamic design isn't necessarily about chasing clean flow everywhere. It's about dealing with what you have to prevent turbulence somewhere and determine where you're willing to control it otherwise. In closed cabin cars, engineers can often prevent turbulence from forming in the first place by keeping the floor attached and energetic. That leads to stable, predictable behavior across a wide range of conditions. Once you remove the top, the strategy largely disappears. Open cars have to accept turbulence to some extent and then deliberately guide it, divide it, and manage its interaction with the cabin and the rear of the vehicle. This also highlights the difference between robust designs and specific designs. Robust designs behave very well across many situations. Specific designs are shaped very carefully around a set of constraints to achieve a very narrow set of requirements. Another key point is why open cars tend to be longer and structured at the rear. Without a roof to control the flow, engineers rely on length and rear decks to give the air time and space to reorganize before it leaves the car. In the end, neither approach is trying to win a single metric, both are examples of engineering, making deliberate trade-offs to serve the role the car is meant to play. And for those interested in applying the same aerodynamic principles beyond cars, I also cover fixed-wing drone design and building in another course here. Peace and amigos.